Proverbs 24, 17 through 18. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls, and do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles, or the Lord will see it and be displeased and turn his anger away from him. Again, I always like to preface this. I, it's kind of probably overstated that we have to make sure we understand different times and different ideas. Principle-wise, what's the idea? Everyone likes to look at the last phrase. Oh, God's going to turn his anger away from your enemy if you if you kind of make fun of him when he falls. No, that's not the case. It's not. Don't emphasize what the Lord is going to uh, do here. Emphasize the fact that what God desires from you as a person. What does He want you to do? And it kind of led me to this thought here. Um, of course, I have to plug this in if I want it to work. Don't make fun of me. I can see Kayla now just laughing at home right now. She's like. She's going to watch from home, she says. She's like, she's just laughing at me right now, I promise you. And ask yourself this question. This is where my thoughts went. Who is your enemy? Now, we can think of a person, but I want you to actually understand who your enemy actually is. Now, I know I'm talking about Satan. I'm talking about individuals who you consider enemies. And who is that person? In actuality, an enemy is an opportunity to demonstrate grace and mercy to them and hopefully they believe even if somebody is in full opposition to you and giving the gospel I actually had that situation occur and actually I, they were my enemy and they're actually a great friend of mine still and a believer because they were in opposition and although I don't think I was very graceful to, I'll be honest with you um, he, he still saw it if not then we demonstrate grace. If we do not demonstrate grace to our enemy, then God may show compassion to our enemy and actually kind of like kind of spurns them in that situation. I, I don't like to take this into our necessarily the recompense for not being kind to our enemies. But at the same time, we have to understand that God's desire for us is to be kind and loving and pray for our enemies that wish them well and to and to hope and, and to give them the gospel. There is every single person should hear the gospel, even if you don't think they deserve it. An enemy is an opportunity to show grace and mercy. Always remember that. Let's pray. God, heaven, thank you for your word, your truth, your wisdom, not ours. For the world says, repay evil with evil. The Lord says, respect, the world says, respect those only if they respect you first. Where you say, love your enemies, respect people even if disrespected to help people even when they are not helpful, to love them even when they're not loving, so that we would be able to demonstrate your character in our lives to those in need. God, thank you that we also were shown grace and mercy through your word and your actions, even though we were unholy, enemies of God. We thank you that we have that um, that truth in our, in our in our minds and we believed it that we are now reconciled to you, and we pray for the world that is not. Help us to be an example, both in word and deed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, book of Philippians, chapter 4. We're going to actually pick up the pace greatly um, after this particular uh, hour. Um, in fact, next week, if uh, the, you know the Lord tarries and the COVID don't rise and I don't go off on too many tangents. I don't think I will. We will finish Philippians next week. Uh, the actual from, from verse 10 on is very personal, and we got to read his personal letter. Um, I like what Luther said about sometimes reading his letters. You're reading someone else's love letter. And we've got to make sure that we keep it in context of the Philippian church and not try to put too much application into our own lives. But there are some definite uh, provisions and examples and principles found within the end of the book of Philippians that we need to pay attention to. At the same time, um, this type, the type of instruction we've been dealing with in four, four through nine, is not the same type of, in, of instruction we're going to get in four, ten through the rest of the book. Okay. This is the last. This is part eight of Philippians four, four through nine. If you have not listened to any of it or you've forgotten, go back and listen to this. 
This is probably one of the most impactful portions of scripture that you can use to actually help you get through difficulty and have peace um, in your life, whether that means internally or with your family or within a church or with a friend. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit or your, your uh, well, I'll, I'll retranslate at the end of this particular lesson. Okay? Let your gentle spirit be made known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. So what we've done so far, and let's go through a way of reminder. If one is not thinking the same thing in the Lord, it will yield disharmony. Anxiety, strife, quarrel, sin, basically a lack of peace. If you're not thinking the same thing, and, and it almost goes to almost anything. If you're in a corporation and, you're, and your board does not think the same thing, there's going to be strife, right? And in a matter of Christianity, if churches and biblical framework, if you're not thinking the same doctrines, if you're not thinking what to think and you're not thinking how to think, you're not using the same manner, you, you will... Um, have disharmony within the body of believers. And if you want to solve that, the first thing you need to do is follow the instruction primarily of the entire book of the Philippians, and that is to have the mind of Christ, right? Um, have the mind of Christ, the what and the how. What does Christ think? How does Christ think? This, this passage in Philippians 4, 4 through 9 is designed to be a solution to the problem in Philippi, which is which is demonstrated in Philippians uh, chapter 3, I think being almost the entire chapter, going into chapter 4, verses 2 through 3. There's a problem. Again, I don't think it's a huge problem. It's not the main emphasis of the book. But there is always some seem to be some type of issue. With And the, the manner of, of finding peace other than the main imperative of have the mind of Christ, is told in seven imperatives. The seven imperatives are rejoice, rejoice. In other words, find reasons to be happy. Speak out the reasons to be happy, um, and generally you will feel better. Let your gentleness be made known to all men, to everybody. In other words, it's a, it's a reasonableness, not a gentleness. Again, we'll retranslate at the end. Be anxious about nothing. In other words, this is undual anxious or undual care, uh, not unnecessarily because there is a proper amount of concern you should have for your family, for loved ones, and you should have a, a, that, that opportunity to, to help where you have the opportunity to help. Let your request be made known. This made known is more of a point out. So you're going to point out your request to God. And, the, the, and think these things. That's the main imperative there, which is, uh, which is verse 8. There's a lot of things to think. And then there is a do these things. There's um, I would say there's a, not a lot of things to do, but it's a good example to follow if you kind of follow that idea. That's the seven imperatives. We have been dealing with, um, we've dealt with the think. Now we're in the middle of do, okay? And then from verse two, the primary idea is to think. What to think? How to think, what to pray, how to focus, <clears throat> how to understand the logic. Remember, this logizomai, that's the, the, the verb, the, the instruction in verse 8, the logizomai, to, to understand the logic of God and Jesus Christ. Now, in verse 9, we have the ought in the form of activity. Do these things. This is where the balance needs to be understood and come in. OK, um, there's always thought before the activity. There's always instruction before what you go out and try to and, and try to function. Instruction before in function uh, in function instruction before function. You have to understand what to do before you can go out and carry it out. This is the biggest issue, I think, in churches and how 
when I, when the churches I used to go to when I was both a kid and as an adult, primarily you get a new believer, you give them things to do without any instruction. And what happens is you fail. You fall flat on your face. You don't know what you're doing. You become uh, frustrated or very self-righteous because you're doing it all within your own understanding and own thoughts. The pendulum swing that has happened, I'll go ahead and call out our own kind of ilk, is Bible churches, which is all thinking and no doing. Honestly, there have been churches have been uh, of our ilk are famous for this. Everyone just sits and listens and takes notes, and there's no there's no action. Now it might be action within pockets of individuals, but there's not a community of people who are functioning together. And Philippians makes this very clear, as well as Ephesians, Romans, that after the thoughts, after the instructions, comes the activity. Now, within these instructions, this this do these things, there are there's a lot of verbs. There are seven, there are six verbs in this in this verse. The first part, which says the things you have learned and received and heard and seen. Okay, that's a dependent clause that, that depends upon the main sentence. The sentence in this verse is a compound sentence, which is actually at the end, which is do these things and the God of peace shall be with you. It's a double verbs. Okay, so the do of these things is a verb and um, will or shall be with you is the second verb there and it's combined by a chi. We'll get to that concept uh, when we get to the, to the to the actual second half of the of the verse nine. This do these things we looked at last week, and it's a prasso word. The prasso simply indicates movement or action involved in attaining a goal, to carry out, to do. Makes sense. Um, the things you learned and received and heard, these are things we also covered last week, but I think we need to make sure we remember them in order to be able to properly grasp the last sentence. Manthano is a word that means to learn by instruction, and that instruction can be verbal or helps in practice or other various means. The word is used throughout the New Testament, especially by Paul, as a general concept of learning. How do you learn? It's like, well, I'm more of a graphic learner. I need to see graphs. I like to see numbers. I like to see pie charts. Okay, that's a way you learn. Other people learn by verbal instruction. Other people are more hands-on. Whatever it is, Montano covers it. Paralimbano means to take alongside, to receive from someone. So you're going to take them alongside. You're going to write there, and they're going to, and you're going to give them something, and they're going to receive it. The person is there with them. It's hard to paralumbano from a distance. Sending them a gift is not paralumbano. That's lumbano. Okay, lumbano means to, to receive um, or to take something. Paralumbano means you received it from somebody who's right there next to you. That's an important distinction because Paul does not leave them alone. And he actually has visited Philippi, I believe, three times. Not only that, but he's also given several individuals, Timothy, Epaphroditus, individuals who he's left there. And Luke was there for, I think, for a long period of time, I think up to seven years, uh, that stayed there and taught these people. They know the information well. Now, I'm not going to go through these verses, but I do want you to go ahead and either, if you have, weren't, didn't write them down last time, write them down now. 1 Corinthians 11:23. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5, Galatians 1, 9 through 12, Colossians 2 through 6, 1 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 4, 1, and 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 through 9. And we looked at these verses last week, and the word not only signifies that the church received something from Paul being right there, but also that Paul, um, that the word indicates a giving and receiving of the most fundamental doctrines of God and Jesus Christ, the most fundamental ones. Everywhere this word is used, it's not used as the, as the deep things. It's the most basic things. And now the word is not technical. Paralambano does not mean that which is given to the most basic doctrines, but it always seems to fit right there because this is basic instructions uh, of doctrine information of, of who Jesus Christ is and who God is. 
So the word indicates a giving and receiving in the most fundamental doctrines of God, Jesus Christ, in those texts. And I think the implication in Philippians chapter 4, the things you have received, is it just the, the, the piece of cake I gave you? No, it's dealing with the doctrines. I think it fits perfectly here. And then finally, hear or heard, to hear with the ear, to heed, to listen. And there are a few important uses by Paul of this word in regards to doctrines, specifically, um, and again, we looked at this last week, so I'm not going to have you go there again, but Romans 10, 14 through 17, which concludes with, so faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. And Ephesians 1 and 4 basically talks about that which you've heard you put into practice. What are the things that are received and heard? The things that are learned, received, and heard, what are they? You can encapsulate this into the everything that Paul had to teach, everything that Paul had to give doctrinally, he's emphasizing it in these three words, learned, received, and heard. And we talked about Romans last time, and when we taught Romans, we understand that there are several different concepts of, of good newses, gospels, if you will. Uh, remember, the gospel can be a technical term, like in and, and Galatians, or it can just basically mean good news, depend upon the context. And what we wanted to, to emphasize uh, last time was the fact that we need to get out of the box of putting the gospel only in Jesus died for your sins. And if you believe that, you're going to heaven. We, that's what we say the gospel is, but in actuality, the entire Bible is actually good news. Uh, the entire doctrines of God, the promises of God are good news. Now, what are the promises of God? What are the gospels? Um, now, people normally, when you say, what are the gospels? You go, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. No, that's, that's the accounts of Jesus Christ and while he was on earth. The gospels, what I'm referring to, is all the good news messages of the New Testament, specifically um, found within, within, the, within the church itself, the, the, the called out ones in this dispensation. There's other good newses found in the Old Testament. Other good news is found within the gospel, specifically Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The gospel of the kingdom is something different. Here, we're going to go to the gospels, which is associated with more of the after uh, the church was established. First of all, the good news of justification, reconciliation. The good news of the benefits of justification. We don't talk about this enough. The grace of God goes way beyond simply I'm going to heaven when I die. There is enough blessings that will keep us busy for a long time if we understand what God has given us. Spiritual blessings by grace. There's the good news of administration. The fact that we're able to participate in God's giving out this a message is, is a truly an, an, an amazing opportunity and blessing that we cannot negate. If we want to sit on the sidelines, we're not fulfilling this particular benefit. There is the good news of purpose, living a life that is an honor in the, of the Father and Jesus Christ, that we have a purpose. Too many times um, this world tries to take away purpose from a person. And when you take away purpose, people fill it with nonsense. Or they give up, and you know the end of that. And finally, there's the good news of promises, expectations of what is to come that's eschatological. I'm going to get a new body. Hallelujah. I think everyone wants a new one. Some, some of you may be satisfied with the one you have. I don't know. I want a new one. I want a better one. But the overall concepts here of dealing with the promises, you look and... and Luther's dealing with Revelation. You, you go ahead and take a look in First and Second Thessalonians and look at the things to come and realize that there's going to be a lot of good things coming. We have not really achieved. The Holy Spirit is simply a down payment over what we're going to have. And that is something to really focus on and understand because sometimes if, we, if this world is all that there is, I'm not sure if you'd be satisfied with that, right? 
Now, the thing seen. The thing seen is the is the verb idon. Now, the word idon is very similar to the word oida, which is a knowledge word. Okay, and it's a very common word in the New Testament. I think there was something like literally like 490 uses of this word. I'm not going to go through them all with you. You're welcome. But the word itself is used five times in Philippians. Most notably in Philippians chapter 1, verses 29 through 30. For to you, Philippian church, it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer. That word suffer is the word pascal, which basically means to be punished, suffer physical persecution for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw, same word, I on, in me, and now here to be in me. So they saw the same conflict in Paul that they're now experiencing and they hear about the same conflict. What was that conflict? Well, if you want to know, we must go to Acts 16. So turn over to Acts 16 and we're going to peruse it. In Acts 16, Paul gets a vision to go to Macedonia. And so in verse 11, he put out to sea from Troas, and we ran straight course uh, to Samthrace, and on the same day following to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in this city for some days. Now, what he would do is typically he would go find a synagogue, but this is a Roman colony. Guess what they don't have in Roman colonies typically? They don't have synagogues. Does it mean there's no Jews there? No, it means they're they're not exactly uh, allowed to practice their religion. Okay, and so he would go down by the river where he expected some people praying, and that's where exactly what he found. He found some Jews because that's what he would do. He would search out the Jews first to find them first, and he found Lydia, and she believed, and she and he says she they prevailed basically going stay with me, stay in my house, don't. Don't pay rent or, or stay in the streets. Stay with me. And she did. And they did. And they were going through the city, continuing their, their, their evangelism. And there was a, a girl there, an oracle, who was following them around, screaming out loud, These men are spawn servants of the Most High, in verse 17, who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. Now, now did she want everyone to get saved? No, she wanted to draw attention to them because the message was in conflict with what is Roman law at that particular colony. And so the people really didn't care until Paul turned around and cast out the demon. And now they've lost, they've lost that opportunity for divination. And so then what happens? Verses 22 through 24, Paul and Silas were imprisoned. Look at verse 23. They struck them with many blows and threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fast their feet in the stocks. That's the type of conflict that the Philippian church saw in Paul. And guess what? He goes, guess what? You get to have this too. Just like you hear about me having this type of treatment in Rome. So the things you saw in me, hmm. do you think they're, uh, get, they're excited about this? Hey, guess what? In the future, very soon, you're going to be thrown into jail, and the things you've seen in me do these things. And, of course, you know the, the story of the Philippian jailer and the earthquake, and he came in. He, he almost killed himself. But Paul says, don't you do any harm. We're all here. And he came in shaken, understanding that they had the message of salvation. How what must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You, It's offered to you in your whole household. So the things that are seen, I don't think it's only this situation, but I think this is a prime example of what the Philippian church saw in Paul. 
We cannot know everything that they saw, but we can understand that the Apostle Paul was given not only what to do, but also was the prime example for all believers to follow. We saw this in Philippians chapter 3, where he says to them, once I find it, um, brethren, join in following my example. So he, they're not going to participate with the gospel, financial giving, to prove the good things according to God, which is in chapter 1, but to be a proper behavioral example to, of a believer. This is what they were supposed to do. This is the example they were supposed to follow. And one of the things that we can look at is, is if you want to know exactly what a believer is supposed to um, do, not in accordance with the apostle, but as a responder to frustration and persecution and the love he has for people, understand the life of Paul as we know it, accordance with Acts and his letters. And if you are able to understand how Paul thought, which he thought after Christ, follow me as I follow Christ, you will, you will have a pretty good idea of what you're supposed to do as a believer. Which kind of leads into next hour dealing with verse 10 and how Paul was content in this life regardless of the circumstance. So the connection here between that which is delivered to the Philippian church via the word or letter and that which we saw in Paul is clear. We can see that. We understand that there was both what Paul spoke, what he lived, and what he was willing to die for. It was all dealing with the truth. He lived for the truth. He spoke the truth. And eventually, he died for the truth. And the God of peace will be with you. Notice that this is reversed from verse 7. Verse 7 says what? The peace of God will guard you. Here it's the God of peace will be with you. And that's very literal. These two clauses, and again, verse, in verse 9, it's the second part of a compound sentence. God is the subject of that sentence. In verse 7, the peace is the subject of the sentence, and that is what guards you. Both are, interestingly, in the future active indicative. What is a future active indicative? Indicative speaks to reality. Future speaks to, well, the future, right? And active means that the, the, either God in verse 9 or peace in verse 7 is the one acting. Okay? And the, and the future active indicative verbs is will guard and will be, and then it has with you. Here's the question. Are these results? I've searched several different grammars who actually talk on this. Most actual commentaries skip this question. Because how do you deal with a future acting indicative connected to an imperative? In other words, you have instruction and then you have a promise. And it's a God promise, right? It's not like a human promise. It's like, hey, you do your chores and we will go for Dairy Queen. No, that's, that's, that's a human promise. It's something different, all right? Uh, so it is, it, we don't normally think of future active and uh, future indicative concepts with human ideas. I remember when I promised Serenity that we, I would take her to um, Universal Studios if she hiccuped for me. That's, you know, you get that anxiety. And if you create anxiety, they stop hiccuping. All right. Well, she hiccup, hiccuped at 12. I took her to we took her when she was 16. <laughs> took a while, but we fulfilled the promise. But you don't know. Humanly speaking, you can't make a promise because you don't know what the future holds. You realize that? This afternoon, we'll go home. I promise. Really? Do I know that? Well, can I can I promise that and it will come to pass? Now, tip, will we probably? Sure. What happens to get on the axe on the way home? What happens if all of a sudden Missouri splits in half and we can't make it across the big chasm? I don't know. I cannot make a promise. I can't. I don't have the power to fulfill. God fulfills this promise. So all the imperative when, when you're dealing with this particular uh, structure of an imperative with a future indicative, the grammars don't agree how to deal with this. You can't say then, 
you do this stuff, then God will fulfill. God will make this promise. That's not how it's structured. The promise is there regardless of the imperative. The imperative is there regardless of the promise. Now, here's the question. Does everybody have peace? Do you have peace that goes beyond comprehension? And even as believers, we go, sometimes no. Sometimes I'm in full panic mode. And, I, and I'm trying to call upon the promise of God. I just can't get it through my head. Why? Well, there's something that's not activated. Okay? Here's what I believe is happening here when you have this structure of the imperative and the promise. It's an imperative that leads to the promise. The promise is already there. The peace of God is already there. You just not you have not yet activated the promise in your own life. You haven't applied it to your life, and therefore you don't have peace. Now, the peace of God, the God of peace, will be with you. That is found in several passages as kind of a benediction throughout all of Paul's writings. It's found in Romans, it's found in Ephesians. It's found, I believe, in Galatians. The God of peace, the God of peace and truth, the God of love and peace will be with you without any attachments to promises. So we, we, that, the God of peace will be with you, I don't believe is tied, to the, is tied to the imperative, although there's an and, meaning I have a conflict. If I can point to several passages, which I'm not going to spend all the time, it's, it's in benedictions. All right, let me show you one. Go to Romans chapter 15. Romans 15, verse 33. He's, in previous verses, he's just given them some some thoughts and some blessings. And in verse 33, he says, Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. And there's several places in Scripture that does this. Okay? So I cannot necessarily tie God, the God of peace, being with you to a particular instruction. However, in Philippians, it looks like it is. But if I can demonstrate, and I, and I, and I can very easily, that the God of peace will be with you is not tied to instruction. Therefore, it's a perpetual promise. And in light of the promise, here's the instruction. The things you have heard and seen and learned and uh, received from me, do these things. The God of peace will be with you. It's not a result. However, if we don't feel like the God of peace is with us, we're probably out of alignment with him. That's all. Get back in alignment. And be at peace. Hopefully I didn't just totally confuse you there. <laughs> if I did, come and ask me about it. We'll talk about it. We'll try to reason through that concept. Okay. Now, to conclude Philippians 4, 4 through 9. And look, I'm actually concluding it. Part 8. Let's render this out a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and, and re... Not a, it's not a translation. I'm re-rendering it. Basically, I'm, I'm expounding upon the translation a little bit, giving it to you. Um, if you want, this will be online at uh, BethHavenChurchKC.com, uh, and you can go ahead and download this so you have it, um, with along with my exposition with it. Okay. Speak out, in verse 9, the reasons to have joy in the Lord always. And again, I will say, speak out the reasons to have joy. It's not a command to be happy. It's a, it's a command to actually proclaim the reasons to be happy. This is not this is to remember and proclaim those reasons. To find the grace of God in any situation, regardless of the distraction or suffering of this world. Remember, they were going to go through physical punishment for Christ. And he is telling them to find the grace. Let your reasonableness... Be made known to all men. Believers must be the examples of one who consider information and make wise decisions. We don't jump to conclusions. We do not make rash decisions. We do not become unduly influenced by that which is false. You always measure the information with the truth, and the truth is, is with God's word. 
the Lord is near. Pretty literal. God is always close. Even though he is beyond us, he has revealed himself to us through creation and through his word. Our attitude needs to reflect the nearness of the Lord. Do not be unduly concerned about anything, but point out your requests to God, for he already knows what you need. In everything, by means of prayer and petitions, with an attitude of being grateful for what you already have received from God, find the grace. Indeed, the peace of God that which goes beyond every understanding will guard the deep recesses of your mind as well as your perception in Christ Jesus. In fact, isn't this the problem we have a lot of times? Is that we lack understanding and we have a better perception of things? We need to understand that if we want to have a better perception, then we need to have the peace of God. How do you obtain the peace of God? Or how, does, how do we activate the peace of God? Rejoice. Let your, your reasonableness, you be reasonable. Don't be unduly concerned about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with an attitude of thankfulness, because we already have been given a lot. Let your requests be made known. Let God point those out to God. Point out requests. In conclusion, I'm not concluding myself, but I'm actually finally. <laughs> In conclusion, as many things are related to or represent the truth of God, think these things. As many things are related to or represent the truth of God, think these things. We're in verse 8 right here. As many things cause one to revere the Lord. That's honorable. So it's a reverence. I remember I was having trouble translate this because I can't find out a single word. As many things cause one to revere the Lord. That's what I've decided on. Consider these things. As many things demonstrate the righteousness of God. Dwell on these things. As many things are separate and holy, just as he is holy. Ponder these things. That word for pure is more of a holy word rather than it is a, uh, an unmixed word. As many things resemble Jesus' love and the love of those who return that love. Because it's, remember it's a reciprocated love here. Fixate upon these things. As many things are of God's Good news. Sorry about that. As many things are of God's good news from the promises of God, think logically in accordance with God's thoughts about these things. You see what I'm doing here? I'm and the word like gets in my, I'm, I'm really expounding upon here. To think, consider, dwell, ponder, fixate, think logically. Because it's all kind of connected to the like gets in my word. If there is anything that shows God's standard of moral excellence, calculate these things. If there is anything that, prop, that is properly evaluated as being worthy of praise based upon God's evaluation, think these things. Those things which you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, do these things, and the God of peace will be with you. It's about as little as you can get. Some concluding thoughts on Philippians 4, 4 through 9. As we have learned throughout the book of Philippians, the believer's first responsibility is to train the mind. It's not to train the body, it's to train the mind. How to think, what to think. And education is necessary to understand what to think. But the process needs to continue to train the believer how to think. Life's purpose. 
satisfaction, happiness, fulfillment needs to be based upon something real and eternal. Disasters, persecution, affliction must not distract us from the eternal perspective of God. After thought training, then we can replicate the behavior that is honoring, pleasing to God. I hope that makes sense. And if you have trouble with the how to think, that is where our worldview class comes in, which will begin in August. We'll get more details as that comes up. Um, be my last plug for that for a while until we talk about it again. All right, let's pray. And then we'll go ahead and jump into next hour in Philippians 4.10. God in heaven, thank you for your word, your truth. It is a, an amazing amount of information that is contained in, in such a short amount of verses. Help us to absorb this information. Help us to grasp it better. Help us to think the mind of Christ. We thank you for the examples. We thank you for the words and your revelation and you preserving it. Help us to mimic it, not only in thought, but also in deed and word. We pray for those who cannot be with us, whether ill or dealing with difficulty, to pray for the Hyings and Everett. Thank you that the Moats are doing well. Give them uh, many blessings as a, and, and a healthy baby. And we thank you that the, that the, uh, the cesarean section went well. God, above all, we thank you that you are God and that you have eternity spelled out for us. Help us to rely upon those promises regularly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.